days I know, I know, these are the days I know. These are the days I know, I know, these are the days I know. David Hoffner, he works in my dad's store. He's worked here for 12 years, he'll probably work here for more. These are the days I know, I know, these are the days I know. These are the days I know, I know, these are the days I know. Dave Gord, I've known since I was six. In grade he broke his leg, so we got drunk and sick. These are the days I know, I know, these are the days I know. These are the days I know, I know, these are the days I know. Some of them are Davids, but most of us are Daves. They all have their own hands, but they come from different moms. These are the days I know, I know, these are the days I know. These are the days I know, I know, these are the days I know. Dave Jadiski, man, this cat can swing. He weighs almost 50 pounds and he delivers my paper on time. These are the days I know, I know, these are the days I know. These are the days I know, I know, these are the days I know. Dave Capisano, I hardly know him. These are the days I know, I know, these are the days I know. These are the days I know, I know, these are the days I know. And even Jane and Peter Fonda, uh, dad, Henry Fonda, did uh, naval intelligence work during World War II and was related through marriage to both the Rothschild family and uh, a top official in the Mussolini regime. All right, guys, this week on the Grand America Show, we're going to be talking with uh, Dave McGowan uh, a little later on. But first, uh, from, uh, from the big city... How's it going tonight, buddy? Hey, Darren. I'm not doing too bad. Doing pretty good. We're doing the non-local thing tonight because we just don't have the time to squeeze everything in. Oh, we're not. You are. <clears throat> I'm you're local. Not. I'm yeah, here. you're in the studio and I'm non-local. So I hope it sounds okay. It'll sound a bit different. but Which renders the question if you actually even exist. That's true. Once you're outside of the studio. I think, therefore, I am. So I do exist. Dooby dooby do. And then, uh, remember, we were going to do the whole thing like this all the time from the beginning. Yeah. Wouldn't have been such a bad idea. Oh. So much room. Yeah. By yourself, lonely in the studio. You could have got Joey to produce from home. <laughs> so, how you been, buddy? What's new? Uh, not much. My sister uh, called me the other night, late. Like 11 o'clock, uh, kind of all excited, and uh, they had that uh, UFO sighting over the city of Vancouver. Which one's that? It's no longer a UFO. It was... Uh, it was No, well, kind of, yeah. But it was... Uh, let me set the scene a little bit. So she calls me. She's got a big deck overlooking... Well, she, doesn't, she shares a big deck. She lives in a condo, and it's overlooking the whole city, right, basically, <clears throat> out the back. Joe's got so, a big deck. Joe's got a big deck. And uh, they barbecue on it. It's like a big shared patio, right? Kind of like a rooftop deck. Anyways, uh, she was there with two friends, and they oh, all like, saw it. Like uh, How I Met Your Mother style? I don't even know that show. I don't mind. But yeah, let's go with that. So they're, uh, they're just, I guess, uh, looking at the view over the city or whatever, and they see these, uh, these two uh, kind of fucking weird things flying through the sky, and, and they couldn't figure out what it was. And it zipped across two of them, I guess they zipped across one way and then they went back and zipped the other way or they came back. And anyways, the three of them were trying to explain this to me. And my sister's on the phone and her two friends are piping in in the background. Like I heard him say, uh, it's the weirdest thing I've ever, I've never seen anything like that. Like they were truly okay, going, what was that? That just flew over the city, right? And they're saying, oh, it looks like... Uh, fireworks uh, coming out of a plane or maybe there was a plane but they couldn't tell if there was a plane or not but but the, the consensus was it was either like anti-aircraft the other idea was like anti-aircraft uh, you know when, when somebody shoots a heat seeking missile at you and you spray that heat shit out the back to distract it you yes, heard of that? I've yeah. seen that yeah. so 
they thought maybe it's like that, but is it a military exercise? What is it? And they had a video of it. They were trying to send it to me, and they're looking at the video, and it did zero justice to the actual sighting, right? So anyways, it turned out that it was um, an air show uh, trial run, and it was a couple planes with fireworks shooting out the back. So they showed, like, cameras in the, from the cockpit and all this. So I guess they kind of, like, secretly had this whole thing set up where they're going to do this thing over the city, right? So, of course, the papers glommed on it. Like, they played the fucking X-Files music in the background on the on the TV news and got all, ooh, people thought they saw UFOs, but it was really like planes with, with uh, fireworks coming out the back. So, yeah, it was pretty cool, uh, pretty cool stunt. And it, it would be, it, I saw other videos of it and it looks, it looks pretty cool. But what I like about the whole thing is there's a couple aspects like, you know, the big picture UFO stuff where, where, First of all, it was hard for me to picture what they saw because there's all these people telling me all these different things and they each had kind of their own take on what it could have been. And even just getting out of them, uh, you know, like the actual, you know, the way it direction it went and how high it was, like I didn't have the time to just, just you know, get into all that, all that stuff, right? Um, but it also shows you that they actually, like, they kind of knew what it was, right? Like, even though you couldn't see the plane, you just saw a bunch of sparks flying through the air. They, you know, they kind of thought, well, it looked like a plane with uh, fireworks coming out the back or sparklers coming out the back. So I think it, that's indicative of, of people sighting sometimes, right? Is uh, they know when something fucking strange happens, right? It's not just venus or the moon or some other fucking simple explanation right like these guys saw what they saw they knew it was strange they kind of thought well looks to me like you know they weren't jumping all over going ets or ufos it was like well it kind of seemed like it was planes with with uh, fireworks out the back um and that's what it was and then also the video just not really showing anything significant at all, right? So you see this thing with your eyes and it looks fantastic. It's like trying to take a picture of a full moon, right? You think I've taken pictures of full hey, moons on. I got a sweet picture of the super moon the other night. Yeah, but it probably wasn't anything near your your naked eye vision, was it? It actually might be better. I was looking no, at it today and I was like, oh, yeah, did that you have your shit beer, might did you have be your better. Beer, beer goggles on or? Hey, where are you going? I'm showing you, you fuck. <laughs> Sorry, I just need a drink of water. No, I did not have my beer goggles on. Oh, what is that? That's a blob. That's a white blob. Look how bright it is. Well, that's what it was. It was but a white blob. That's a, I couldn't even tell you that's a moon. So well, you're just, just proving you. my point for you. If you showed me that for and me? say, what's this picture of? I'd be like, I don't know. It's a bright light. Yeah, well, everyone else would be like, oh, it's the moon. Thanks, buddy. So you don't agree with me that uh, that taking pictures just does not do phenomenon justice? Oh, I agree with that. Okay, well, that's all I'm trying to say. Anyways, yeah, that was uh, that was that was cool. That was very interesting. So they were testing out new countermeasures. What? Well, I think that's what it's called, isn't it? When you shoot shit out the back of the plane. No, no, it wasn't that at like all. It was launch, fireworks. Launch countermeasures. No, it was fires. It was uh, fireworks. Allegedly. Did they oh, look yeah. like fireworks? <laughs> yeah, it looked like fireworks. And they showed actual footage of the guys in the in their in their plane too. Like real footage afterwards. Not just somebody's backyard handicam footage. So there's no conspiracy, buddy. It's just fireworks out of a plane's ass. That's shitty. <laughs> I prefer a good uh a, a good, good conspiracy. conspiracy. Yeah, well, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, did you hear about that big hole they found in Russia? Or Serbia, maybe? Was it like uh, Mel's hole? Who's Mel? Mel was an old uh, Art Bell uh, guest who had a big hole in his backyard. They used to just throw trash in it and stuff, and it was like so deep that they couldn't find the bottom of it. So it was called Mel's Hole, and they'd have him on every once in a while talking about it. That's old classic, like, coast-to-coast Art Bell stuff. They were talking about it on the Grayland Report the other night. Oh, were they talking about this same hole? Or... Yeah, probably. Yeah. Looks crazy. Have you seen the picture of it? No, I haven't even seen it. Like 80 meters across. So is it like a blue hole, but in the land? I don't know. I think they... Yeah, yeah, exactly. They don't know how deep it goes. 
Hmm. Think it was the aliens? No, I think they're blaming global warming. Really? Yeah. Is it completely circular? It is completely Did somebody circular. make it to blame global warming, or is it really like a natural phenomenon? I don't know. When I look at it, it almost looks like something hit there, man. Like, <clears throat> it just like <clears throat> melted right in. But what do I know? <clears throat> I don't know much about it. I was just looking at the pictures and shit. It looks pretty cool. And it's on like uh, legitimate websites. <clears throat> Seems legitimate anyway in Serbia. So are they saying it's like a sinkhole then? No, they're saying it was like trap gas or something that just popped it all out like a cork. Trap gas, eh? Trapped probably greenhouse gas, which is making it even warmer now. So is that is that a regular phenomenon? Like those kind of explanations always make me wonder. Have you ever heard of trapped gas creating holy bubbles? Well, yeah, I think I've seen some like TV shows where that like shit happens to boats. Oh, where, like, like the methane comes up from the bottom and the water becomes unbuoyant. I've even yeah, heard people explain. I don't know if that's the same thing, though. Were you, were you going to say people explain the Bermuda Triangle as of that? Maybe. You'll never know. You cut me <laughs> off. Stepped all over me. <laughs> Please continue, sir. I forget now. I forget. Once I go off, once that's I lose it, That's a short-term it, memory. Gone. That's gone, eh? <laughs> I'll come back in, like, maybe 20 minutes, half an hour. <laughs> Do you write notes, then? Ah, uh, no. Make, no. No, you don't make a note, I, I scribble. No, you just let it go? You just let it go? Usually when I'm podcasting, I scribble on paper, yeah, I noticed. but it's I noticed. completely ineligible, ineligible and doesn't really <laughs> fucking say anything. It's not even really doodling. No, it's just a distraction, but you think it helps you pay attention or something like that. It does help me pay attention. I don't buy it. You're a distraction. Crossy from looking at you. Distracted <laughs> me. <sighs> so do you have any spam? Uh, yeah, I just got one. Uh, <clears throat> synchronicity from our buddy, Gitmo Yoho. Mr. Yoho. I think he's partially responsible for the money bomb being launched in June. Yeah, he was. He was the bell saver. The bell toller? Uh, bell, uh, I guess. I, I, guess bell he was, I guess he was the bell. He was the bell. The bell ringer. <laughs> okay, guess, so. It was his, it, he was the bell. So he sent he sent a, a good one in here. So he's got synchronicity of the highest order, and of course uh, we love Gitmoyo. He's a he's one of our favorite listeners, huge fan. He's helped us out lots, and so this is this is a good Made one here. Made the UFO so. jingle. This is true, the UFO quote jingle. So I think, uh, he I says think they picked up what I was putting down. Hey, there's new listeners, buddy. Isn't there? Probably, but they'll figure it out when we get to the segment. All righty. Okay, so he says, I visited my brother in Boulder, Colorado last week with my son, who had never been there. So we're going to do all the obligatory sightseeing things, which included a trip up to Rocky Mountain National Park. And, of course, the best, or at least the easiest access to an exquisite view is Rainbow Curve. And he attached a picture of the view from Rainbow Curve. We were getting ready to leave. It was about 11 a.m. and the trip takes about two hours. When I decided that although the trip was worth it, it might be too much of a drive for my five-year-old son. So we decided to leave a little later, stop and eat, then visit El Dorado Canyon, which is only about 30 minutes away. After grabbing some food, we set out to our destination when we noticed a double lightning strike up in the mountains. So we all saw it. As your eyes naturally gravitate towards the mountain view when you don't see them every day, I said, wow, I wonder how close that was to where we were going to go today. (laughs) Turns out that that lightning struck near Rainbow Curve Overlook at the exact time that we were supposed to have been there had we not changed plans. And then he sent a link to this news story, which is fucking crazy. This is the first time in 14 years that anybody has ever been killed by lightning in the park. And like I said, it is our obligatory destination for scenic views. When I read the news story and where the lightning struck, it really kind of freaked me out. It freaked us all out. These were, in my opinion, synchronicious events of the highest order. Synchronicious. I I like that. 
Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> so the other thing is uh, it, it injured seven and killed one person, this double lightning strike. Did he write synchronicious or did you yeah. misspeak? No, he wrote it. Well done. Would I mispronounce one of our listeners' emails, buddy? No, you actually do uh, <laughs> read the UFO quotes verbatim, even <laughs> even the typos. <sighs> That's so, a crazy yeah. one, eh? It's kind of we we should have a name for the avoidance of death synchronicity, like certain certain death avoidance synchronicity. We could call it like the the CD CDA CDAS. You know who are we talking to not too long ago about um, about uh, fuck was it Sarah Chetkin or uh, Patty Conklin? I can't remember why. We're talking to someone about uh, multiple lives or, or having so much to accomplish in your life. And if uh, you've got, I, I remember they specifically mentioned exit points. You've got so many exit points. And um, <clears throat> when you get to said exit point, if, you're, if you haven't achieved everything you're supposed to achieve, then you just keep right on going. For some reason that makes me think of that. Huh. Like it was just meant to be that he didn't make it up there? Because he has to live on, kind of thing. Exactly. He has more work to be done in this realm. Yeah, actually, but I, I say it's probably since he found Grand America. More synchronicities are happening. And mm. he's got f- higher purpose. Yes, I was going to say that your higher power is looking out for you, buddy. But I would like to know more about his thought process on not going because it's the trippy thing when something changes your mind, right? And it's like, well, our plan was to go here, but we somehow decided not to. Yeah, you wonder sometimes if it even can be like deep down instinct. Yeah. You know, some yeah. buried it, fucking primal. Yeah, exactly. And he rationalizes it by just saying, oh, it'll be too long of a drive for my five-year-old. But really, there's some other deeper gut feeling that it's hard to recognize, right? Yeah, and it's even kind of got a little bit of the ripple before the stick. I'm going to give it a... Uh, that's got to be a... That's a nine. Really? Yeah. Wow. Generous today. He avoided death. Certainly avoided death. The CDO synchronicity. CDO? Yeah, the certain death avoidance. No, CDA. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Yeah. Do we have a jingle for that? So, uh, yeah, other than that, just got some cool feedback from, from listeners. Um, you know, I, I feel like we shouldn't even say that every episode, but... What was CDO? CDA. Certain death avoidance. Uh, I like classic death avoidance. Oh, my God. Classic death avoidance. Now, certain it. death avoidance has a Monty Python-ish ring no, to it. it's not certain death, though. But that's the point of it. Could just be a maiming. That's the point of it. Well, supposed how to is call that the it point? certain death because it's like a there's a Monty Python skit about certain death. Fuck, you live in a Monty Python movie, don't you? <laughs> <sighs> really is something else. Oh, okay. Anyways, thanks for the feedback. We got some listeners at uh, one in China, and uh, a couple more uh, more local guys just saying that they like the show and. They like the banter between us. So, I don't know. It's just good to hear. Banter. And and I don't want to... I, I also feel it's like... It's funny. Sometimes we get the most compliments on our banter, and other times we get the most complaints. Yeah, that's... The, I have a feeling that that's what it's going to be like. Because I used to like shows, old podcasts that I'd listen to. I'd like the, the pre-show before the interview. Sometimes better than the interview. So, of course, it all depends on the guests, but... And the banter. And the banter. And I also want to say that uh, people must be listening when they listen to all these podcasts. They must hear like over and over people asking for donations and asking for money. Like I only know of, you know, one podcast I think that doesn't ask for money. And now we're doing it too, but we're really doing it in a different way. We, we don't want to ever charge, should I say ever? We don't want to charge money for extended versions or anything like that. We have no ads. We don't want to do anything like that. We just want to basically cover our costs here and then see how it goes from there. And so we're doing this 50-50 money bomb draw where we get uh, donations from listeners and we'll give, uh, we'll put the money in a hat and pull one out and give uh, half that back. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's like uh, when we uh, if we get busy like we have the last little while and we get extra episodes, I think, you know, we decided a long time ago we'll just, um, you know, instead of charging people, we'd like to just throw everything out there and it's more about, uh, uh, you know, stretching the reach than uh, charging, charging a select few to hear the content. We'd rather it got as far as it could and, yeah, you know. That's that, and if uh, if our donation only model doesn't make us, then it doesn't really matter. No. <laughs> so yeah, speaking of which, check out the money bomb. We've been uh, we got another new new subscriber yesterday, so we always like to see subscribers. Head over to grimerica.ca slash money bomb. Uh, let me know if you want an email address if you if you subscribe. <laughs> And uh, there's some some no donation required options there as well. Uh, everything's listed on the page. Yeah, and also if you're on the website, check out the backstage area. That's where you can actually uh, listen to the interview part live. Maybe the intro like this sometimes, but usually just the interview. And uh, join up in the chat room if you want. Yeah, it's something new. We're just kind of dipping our feet in for now. We'll see uh, see where it takes us. That's actually on Mixler too, right? Mixler, M-X, what? Sorry, Mix. M-I-X-L-R dot com. Yeah, slash Grimerica, right? Yeah, or Grimerica dot C-A slash. Backstage. All right, time for the profound UFO quote of the week. This? Okay. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. We had objects with four-way confirmation, ground visual, ground radar, airborne visual, airborne radar. It doesn't get any better than that. In my following of unusual aerial phenomena for the past 50 years, there seems to be some reason to discredit very viable and very reputable witnesses when they say something is unidentified. That's the U.S. Air Force Office of Special Investigations, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Brown, DP, page 247. DP. Yeah. Page so. 247? Yeah. wonder what that means. Page 247 of the DP. Of the D DB or DP? DP. Like penetration? <laughs> <laughs> yes, as in that. I thought DB like debriefed. Oh yeah, no, could be a typo. Could be. I thought that was an appropriate one for Dave McGowan since uh, all the people he's talking about have you know those types of connections, high level intelligence connections. But we don't have any high level intelligence connections or even any high level intelligence. One day. One day. Get I got one lined up. up. I got one lined up. One what? Intelligence connection. Yeah. Kinda. CIA is it the CIA Twitter feed? <laughs> no. Only when I want to know what's going on with the overall UFO mystery do I follow the CIA Twitter feed. Thanks, it. guys. You heard it here first. So uh, yeah, Dave McCowan, this is a good interview. Um, oh, yeah, this one's gonna fucking melt some ears, I think. We got a few people in the chat room and uh, and tweeting that we're listening live, saying that uh, this is one of the crazier ones they've heard, and it it really is a jaw on the floor sort of. You kind blow of, your fucking mind, isn't that what they said? Yeah, we knew what we were getting into, but uh, we didn't know how deep we were getting into it. Yeah, yeah, that was good. Yeah. Um, so other than that, I suppose we might as well jump right into it, right? The, the chat's uh, longer than usual, so it's not super long, but I think it's about uh, 90 or 100 minutes. So enjoy the interview, guys.
Okay, guys, tonight in Grimerica, we're going to be talking with Dave McGowan, talking uh, Laurel Canyon and the and the hippie movement. But first, uh, the great Graham Dunlop himself. How's it going tonight, buddy? Hey, good, buddy. I thought you were going to come up with some more G words besides great. Yeah, I lost my That's thesaurus. A, uh, your shtick. <laughs> so we, we've got, uh, like Darren said, we've got David McGowan here. Who's, he was born and raised in California. I think he still lives in California. He's the author of a few few uh, pretty cool books here program to kill the politics of serial murder and understanding the F word American fascism and the politics of illusion. And he's just released this, uh, this great book here called we weird scenes inside the Canyon, Laurel Canyon covert ops and the dark heart of the hippie dream. So this is, uh, this is some really crazy stuff. He's hitting a nerve with a lot of people. He's going to tell us about how, uh, how he's uh he's turning into a very popular guy so we want to we're glad we got you so <laughs> soon before you totally explode so welcome to uh the great america show david well thank you for having me very happy to be here nobody leaves california graham that's why <laughs> hotel california oh that's, that's right. right you check in and you never you leave. can check out but you can never leave right or how does that go yeah check <laughs> in <something> like that. <laughs> so yeah. dave Dave, let's start with some, like, just sort of tantalizing overview or, or like, a little summary of, of some of the stuff you've found out about this dark heart of the hippie dream. Like, it's, uh, I've heard, I, I'm, I kind of left um, some of it. I've heard a little bit of your talks on a couple of other shows, but I haven't heard some of the tantalizing bits. So I wouldn't mind starting off with a bit of that before we get into too much of the background. Um. Well, there's a number of themes that, that kind of run through the book that that are all uh, run counter to the, you know, the prevailing view of uh, the Laurel Canyon scene, which is um, actually hasn't really been reported on a lot at all. You know, there, mm-hmm. there's actually been very few, uh, very little, there's very little literature that, uh, on the Laurel Canyon scene. And, and what there is is only developed like, since uh, like 2007, I think, when Michael Walker uh, put out his, the, the, what was really the first mainstream book to, to chronicle this scene, uh, his Laurel Canyon, and that's then been followed by a few others. And, uh, you know, these, these books tend to paint a very kind of idyllic, uh, you know, view of Laurel Canyon as this almost perfect sort of very bucolic uh, hippie commune where everyone kind of had an open door policy and uh you know all of these people who were destined to emerge as superstars you know all of these bands and artists you know everyone from the doors and love and buffalo springfield and the birds and the turtles and the beach boys and three dog night and and um, a whole bunch of other ones the turtles the monkeys um you know people like jackson brown uh Judy uh, Collins, Judy Sill, Joni Mitchell, Carol King, uh, uh, James Taylor. Just, I mean, just just an an amazing array of both bands and uh, singer songwriters that uh, that came out of the scene in a very short period of time, and the. Uh, the the, the 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 picture that's been painted of it thus far is uh, is like I said is this very almost like ideal hippie commune where uh, you know it's it was kind of set off from the rest of the city up in the Hollywood Hills in this very kind of rustic heavily wooded uh, section of the city that, that doesn't really feel like the rest of L.A. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it kind of lent itself to that sort of thing and um, you know like I say it was just just sort of a scene where it was a time and era where where you could uh, by legend anyway just kind of walk down the boulevard and and you might hear like you know Eric Clapton and and David Crosby and Graham Nash or something jamming in Mama Cash's front yard you know and then a few blocks later you go by you know Frank Zappa's log cabin and there's you know 
you know, whoever, <laughs> all these other, you know, and, and literally just kind of, just kind of hear all of these amazing songs that are now, you know, uh, to this day are, are these huge iconic rock songs actually being written and developed in this very, you know, it's just sort of like a giant hippie commune, you know, and, but uh, as my research has revealed, um, there were very, very dark undercurrents to that scene, and it wasn't all the peace, love, and understanding vibe that uh, you know that we were supposed to believe that it was. Uh, for one thing, there, there was just just an amazing number of military and intelligence connections to this scene, uh, both in the fact that there was a covert military installation right there in the heart of Laurel Canyon and in the fact that so many of these artists, particularly the ones that, that emerged as the biggest stars of the scene and, and kind of the, the spokesmen for the generation, so to speak, uh, to an overwhelming degree, all came from, from military, career military and military intelligence uh, family backgrounds. Mm. And, um, and then in addition to that, there was just, just an uncanny number of of uh, suspicious deaths connected to the scene, just, you know, bodies dropping left and right, uh, oftentimes very, very violent deaths. Um, <sighs> you know, the, like the, the two most notorious cases being the, the Manson murders and the Wonderland murders, which, um, which are the two, you know, considered by the, you know, veteran LAPD homicide detectives to be arguably the two most bloody and brutal mass murders in the city's history, and uh, both with direct connections um, to the canyon. The Wonderland murders actually took place in Laurel Canyon on Lookout Mount or on uh, Wonderland Avenue. And that was at the and same time frame. That was la actually later. That was 1981. That was as the scene was really had pretty much faded out, but there were still some vestiges of it. And uh, cocaine had really kind of taken over the scene, and uh, the people that were killed in that were uh, were heavy cocaine dealers that were supplying some of the uh, some of the stars that were still remaining in the canyon. Uh -huh. And uh, there was uh, five people that were brutally bludgeoned in that attack. One of them miraculously survived; the other four did not. And then the uh, the other case being, of course, the Manson murders, which occurred in 69, right at the height of the scene. And uh, they occurred a few canyons over in Benedict Canyon, but pretty much all of the people involved, both uh, victims and uh, perpetrators, were all very much a part of the Laurel Canyon scene. And they all kind of ran in the same circles and had mutual friends and whatnot. Wow. Um, you know, uh, like Jay Sebring, uh, for example, he was, uh, <clears throat> he's the guy that is credited with creating, uh, Jim Morrison's famous, uh, hairdo, actually, <laughs> his, uh, notorious mane that he was so famous for that was sculpted by, uh, Jay Sebring. And he was also a business partner of, uh, John Phillips and, uh, had various other connections to the scene as well. And, and Sharon Tate was, was very much an active part of the scene. She was a regular visitor to, uh, John Phillips house, Mama Cass's house, various other, there were, there were certain houses in, in Laurel Canyon that were kind of known as, as basically keeping open house 24 seven huh. where people would just like come and go, you know, <laughs> as they pleased. And, uh, and so a lot of a lot of these people, you know, generally uh, hung out at those at those locations. Sharon Tate being uh, being one of them. And um, let's see who else was. Uh, oh, and uh, Abigail Folger and uh, Wojtek Frykowski, two of the other victims there, actually lived in Laurel Canyon. They lived in a home right across the street from Mama Cass's house. Wow. And and often had the same guests. You know, like people like Sharon Tate would and and whatnot. They. Uh, <laughs> would visit both of them so so they they all kind of traveled in the same circles very much so and and the uh the killers as well charlie manson was very much a part of the laurel canyon scene and by some reports hung out at both john phillips and uh, mama cass's house the same the same places where the the victims hung out you uh -huh. know and um uh, 
And Bobby Beausoleil, for a time, uh, actually had his own apartment in Laurel Canyon and was the rhythm guitar, the original rhythm guitarist for the band Love before they were known as Love when they were known as the Grassroots. So, um, yeah, pretty much all, you know, I mean, to, to a large extent, everybody that was involved in that, both victims and uh, perpetrators, were all very much a part of the Laurel Canyon scene. So uh, that was the most notorious, uh, you know, uh, violent series of violent deaths that were, that were connected to the scene. But there were a lot of other ones as well. There were a couple girls' bodies that were girls who were who were murdered and and uh, butchered and their bodies dumped in laurel canyon during its heyday and uh people like ramon navarro the silent film star he was murdered in his home on uh the day the night before halloween in either 1968 or 1969 uh inger stevens a former starlet was uh also found dead in her home uh, Lenny Bruce was found dead in his home during that period. Sal Minio was murdered in front of his home. Diane Linkletter either jumped or was tossed off the balcony of a, an apartment at the mouth of Laurel Canyon. Wow. And uh, so, th those are just some of the more well-known ones. There, was, there were all kinds of them. Uh, Graham Nash's uh, girlfriend was murdered. Uh, Jackson Brown's wife committed suicide. David Crosby's girlfriend and president of his fan club was was killed in, uh, I believe it was a head-on collision. Holy shit! And so there's a there's a ton, it, way way above average as far as you know. Oh way, yeah. And, deaths and then the musicians and that kind of themselves, stuff. you know, people like Graham Parsons, of course, who who uh, very closely connected to the scene, died out in J at Joshua Tree and. Uh, very early 70s, I don't remember exactly what year. Clarence White, who was uh, one of the birds at one time. And just, I mean, just a withering array of people who, uh, who came to very suspicious, oftentimes very suspicious ends. Uh, Brandon DeWild, who was a child actor, turned musician, who was part of the scene. Uh, he was like decapitated, I believe, in a car accident. And mm. it was just... Just an amazing array of very, very violent and oftentimes very suspicious um, deaths that occurred. Uh, this one, one guy named Larry Williams, who was a songwriter, composer. He'd written songs that had been covered by the Beatles and uh, Rolling Stones, various other bands, and had done some... Uh, some uh, some work on his own. He was uh, shotgunned to death in his in his garage of his Laurel Canyon home. Uh, just it's just mind boggling how many violent deaths were uh, were connected to that scene. Either that either occurred in Laurel Canyon or to people very closely connected uh, With, to yeah. the scene. Yeah. So so that's like, one of the threads of your book, and then and then the other couple threads. There's one that's really the the uh, sort of the Laurel Canyon being an unknown start of the whole hippie movement, right? Like people associate it more like in uh, like hate Ashbury in San Francisco or whatever. And, yeah, that's, that's... and that's another thread. And then the other thread is, is all the intelligence uh, connections. Is yeah. That, that right? Yeah. There's, yeah, I would, yeah, I would definitely agree. Yeah. The, uh, the fact that, that it's still, that to this day, even the mainstream version of the Laurel Canyon story, you know, the fact that there was this, this, this amazing scene that so many bands came out of and that it actually preceded the Haight-Ashbury scenes and produced far more music and far more more influential stars than the Haight-Ashbury scene ever did. And yet, to this day, you know, if you talk about hippies or flower children or 60s counterculture, I mean, 99% of the time, people's minds go immediately to hate Ashbury. That's viewed as the, the birthplace and sort of, uh, you know, uh, yeah. capital of hippiedom or whatever. And uh, But it's not actually true. It actually began... Uh, right here in L.A. in in little old Laurel Canyon. Yeah, and, when uh, people hear Laurel Canyon, they probably think of the porn star. <laughs> <laughs> is there a porn star? Yeah, there? I think, I'm yeah. sure there is. Yeah, somebody said, "Oh, you mean the porn star?" And we're like, "No, no, 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 the place where the the music started." <laughs> I know there used to be one named Christy Canyon. Yeah, yeah. It was, but I didn't know there was a Laurel Canyon, but it doesn't surprise me. Canyon's <laughs> probably a popular porn last name. 
<laughs> I would guess so. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so so what? Okay, let's get into the intelligence background. That's the part I'm I'm kind of itching to hear about. You know, I, well, it I, almost sounds like a string of messy CIA. You know, people who aren't going along with the shtick just poof, get decapitated know, in car crashes. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, but I mean, but it's, it, I think it goes deeper than that, right? It's, it's uh, if there was an intelligence background, like I don't want to start getting into the hypothesis now because I, I don't know what, what you think about it, David. But it, it seems deeper than that. Like if there was intelligence connections with almost all these people that were there at the time, I mean, who knows what that means? It could mean a number of different things, but but you've really dug into to the details in that, right? Uh, as much as I can, you know, I mean, you can, you can't always tell, um, in a lot of cases it, it, it was, you know, I mean, it was, it was pretty explicit in the, in the literature. If you dug deep enough to, you know, you could find out who the, who these people's parents are. And in other cases, it's, you know, you got to kind of read between the lines, you know, like, like Graham Parsons, for example, um, his real father uh, supposedly committed suicide, like right before Christmas. Although it looked a whole lot like a murder, but uh, you know that, that's another theme that runs through this book: is a whole lot of suicides that may or may not have actually been suicides. Um, you know, but I mean that's pretty much the case with a lot of suicides connected to any any bit of weird. You know, I mean yeah. any good conspiracy always has a trail of bodies. You know, yeah. leading away from it. So. Um, but you know, he, he is uh, whatever. What, however, he died. His his father died when he was quite young, and uh, his mom remarried, and he was raised by his stepdad. And you know, there's no indication anywhere in the literature that I could find that his father had an intelligence ba or his stepfather rather had an intelligence background. But what it does state is that his uh, stepdad was very deeply involved with training expatriate Cuban groups. Um, in the in secret bases in the Florida Everglades to overthrow the Castro regime, you know, during the early '60s, early to mid '60s, and uh, and Graham Parsons actually visited these bases on on at least one occasion and was photographed there by Life magazine, who later destroyed the photographs and never published them. <laughs> Because it because it wouldn't have wouldn't have been too good for for his image I suppose but anyway the point being uh, you know I I think we all know who was in charge of of funding and running those operations you know I, I don't I don't think his dad was just freelancing as you know a guy training Cuban expatriate group, groups to overthrow the Castro regime so right. you know it, it's not a real stretch to assume that his dad was a CIA operative you know or his step that rather so yeah, yeah. But, but in a lot of cases it, it's you know it, it's 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 quite overt you know like like frank zappa was the son of a uh, chemical warfare engineer assigned to the edgewood arsenal originally and frank was actually born there um, on the base uh, his father was living in uh, housing on the base at the time and he attended school. He attended uh, kindergarten and elementary school. He spent the first seven years of his life literally living on and being educated at the Edgewood Arsenal, the, which is not only the home of, longtime home of U.S. chemical warfare research, but also has been implicated repeatedly in, in uh, unclassified documents as being deeply involved in the MK oh, at various MK Ultra projects, <laughs> sub projects, and that's where he spent the first seven years of his life. You know, so that's you know a little odd, yeah. <laughs> to yeah, say slightly. the least. Yeah. You know, and then you know people like Jim Morrison, whose father was a U.S. Navy admiral who was in, uh, he was the commanding officer of the fleet of ships involved in the Gulf of Tonkin incident, <laughs> and uh, so his father was the one who directly oversaw that entire operation that led directly to the introduction of ground troops into Vietnam and into a ten, bloody, you know, 10 year quagmire that left all kinds of bodies. And, um, his father w was one of the key architects in that whole operation. And it almost simultaneously with Jim emerging on out of Laurel Canyon as this icon of the anti-war, uh, you know, generation. So, uh, that, that's a recurring theme throughout the, throughout the book is how many of these people's fathers were sort of directly involved in, 
in uh, you know various military and uh, covert operations at the same time that the the kids were uh, be, you know being elevated to the spokesmen for the the anti-war youth generation and um, you know I mean it, it's it's staggering to you know if you look if you look at the 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 people who served as sort of the front men, the lead men, the, the people who emerged as the, as the biggest stars or whatever, uh, you see it over and over and over again, whether it's Jim Morrison with The Doors or Frank Zappa of The Mothers of Invention, John Phillips from The Mamas and the Papas, David Crosby from The Birds, Stephen Stills from Buffalo Springfield, <laughs> all three of the guys from the band America, all of them who were all... Uh, all sons of uh, U.S. Air Force intelligence officers who actually grew up on and met on a military base. Uh, Jackson Brown was born and born on a on a military base in occupied Germany, post World War II. Um, you know, John Phillips was the son of a career uh, Marine Corps officer, and his wife his or his first wife, his mother, and his sister were all three uh, career employees of the Defense Department, Pentagon employees. So, I mean, his entire family was, uh, you know, inc including his first wife, who was also, um, her name was Susie Adams, was also a direct descendant of uh, second president of the United States, John Adams. So um, not only, and that's another common theme, actually, <laughs> is that not only do you have... Um, not only do you have a lot of people coming from from a military or military intelligence background, you also have people who appear to be from what I don't know what you would call like bloodline families, for lack of a better word. These these families that go back uh, really to to like the Mayflower days, to like the, the you know families that have wielded considerable power uh, in the country uh, for a very long time. Uh, David Crosby being a prime example, <clears throat> whose full name is David uh, Van Cortland Crosby, and um, he comes from a a trio of intermarried families: the Van Cortlands, the Van Rensselaers, and the Van Schuyler families that uh, have wielded power in this country since since the very beginning. I mean, you can find them as members of the Continental Congress, signers of the Declaration of Independence. Revolutionary War generals, Civil War generals, senators, congressmen, judges, you know, short of president, they've occupied like every position of power imaginable in this country for over 200 years. And uh, same is true, like, like Ed Doheny, who was a d descendant of the, the Doheny oil clan, uh, just a, an insanely wealthy family, uh, Graham Parsons family uh went way way back and uh you know one time owned like over half the citrus groves in in uh, florida and georgia and um also uh spawned the hershey family that founded uh the hershey uh chocolate company in the city that grew up around it so uh another you know another guy that was indirectly responsible for john Kerry then or no, oh, really? that's maybe that Nestle or is that Hershey? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, so you have, uh, so you have these people that come from these, you know, just hugely wealthy, you know, politically influential families, uh, and or from you know mil career military uh, or intelligence families, and often the two of them combined, you know, like, <laughs> like Graham Parsons, who, whose family, you know, was was both. Um, so though, though, you know, yeah, they, they, uh, they don't really, you know, I mean, when you look at, <laughs> when you look at these people, they don't really seem to fit the mold of just sort of these struggling grassroots, uh, musicians, you know, who kind of came together to form this, this organic movement, you know, because, yeah. uh, their family backgrounds just don't tend to indicate that 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 that's the case, you know. And, and that's actually another theme of the book is just how strange it was that this scene formed where it did, and how quickly it did, and and uh, just how quickly these these bands were uh, 
were put together and put out there and promoted and, and became these just just uh, you know hugely successful bands seemingly out of nowhere. Yeah, yeah. And um, so that so those. Oh, go ahead. No, well, that's that's a huge list of of connections. I mean, it, it's it's kind of overwhelming. And and when you, I mean, obviously, if you looked at one or two of them on their own, it would really not mean anything. But when you put it all together like that, that's pretty crazy. The strange thing that I find is that it's from such a variety too. Like it's almost like a a piece from every uh, you know um, compartmentalized uh, military background like there's the the u.s air force and the you know the, the cold, cold <laughs> yeah. rocks the mk ultra stuff the chemical warfare stuff the depart department of defense like it's crazy so so um what would people say like would the skeptical people say like the people go oh this is just a you know conspiracy theory blah 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 they obviously got famous because they had these connections or it was easier for them to kind of climb up the ladder because they had you know wealthy backgrounds i mean it seems like that really wouldn't fly, but I can see a lot of people trying to say that. Uh, well, the, the thing that I get a lot is is people saying, "Well, you know, it makes perfect sense that that that, that these uh, that these people would choose the path that they took because they right. were rebelling against yeah. their parents. They were yeah. rebelling against the values of their parents and going in exactly the opposite way." Yeah, and. And I could see that if it wasn't to such an overwhelming degree. And my argument is that in the 1960s, pretty much every kid in the country wanted to pick up a guitar, grow his hair out in front of a rock band, you know. And, you know, so a lot of them didn't have talent, but quite a few of them did. And, you know, what was it really only the sons and daughters of the, the military establishment that had what it took to rise to the top? Or were they just the ones who were promoted and, and sort of maneuvered into that position. And, you know, I would tend to, <laughs> I would tend to go with the latter, you know, and um, another thing that kind of, you know, another, another, another key, to, another, another piece of the puzzle is that some of these people actually had prior connections. Um, Frank Zappa's wife, for instance, Gail Slotman, <laughs> it was her maiden name. She was also a uh, a Navy brat. Her her father and several generations of her family were uh, career career naval officers and naval intelligence officers. So she came from that very same background, and she actually knew uh, Jim Morrison when they were like five years old. They knew each other through <laughs> Navy, naval officer circles and actually attended the same kindergarten together when they were five years old. Yeah, that seems like And uh, according to industry legend, she actually supposedly hit Jim over the head with a hammer in their kindergarten class when they were just, you know, little toddlers. But anyway, so, you know, it's a little odd that 20 years later, just out of nowhere, uh, both of them sim just almost simultaneously show up in Laurel Canyon. He as this larger than life iconic rock star, and she as the wife of another iconic larger than life rock star. And then on top of that, Frank Zappa's manager was this shadowy guy by the name of Herb Cohen, who happened to have a cousin by the name of Howard Kalen who fronted another Laurel Canyon band known as the Turtles. <laughs> so all, all three of these front men for these bands who all landed in, in Laurel Canyon like pretty much simultaneously as the, head, you know, the front men for these bands all had this curious web of former connections before they all just happened to arrive there. So, you know, I mean, at some point you got to say just, just how many coincidences can there be here, you know, before this has to be some kind of a, a planned, you know, operation of some sort. Because <laughs> it just doesn't seem very organic that these people that, you know, all come from. And Herb Cohen was a very shadowy figure as well before he arrived on the scene as, a, as a Frank Zappa and other people's manager. Um he had, you know, he had a pretty curious history. He just happened to have been in the Congo at the very time that the uh, the CIA was toppling um, 
Patrice uh, Lamumba, I think his name was, uh, they staged a coup, and he just happened to be in the country at that very same time. <laughs> and then after that, he showed up in like Northern Europe operating as an international arms dealer. And then next thing you know, he's in Laurel Canyon as Frank Zappa's manager. <laughs> you know? So so all of these people just have very, very curious backstories for, you know, for people that that were kind of spearheaded this uh, this whole, you know, peace, love and understanding and flower power scene. And um, so, yeah, and, you know, and, and and there's there's more, you know, I mean, Amy Lou Harris, she she was another one. She grew up on a series of uh, military bases in and around Washington, D.C., and, you know, I mean, just and just on and on and on. And then actually, in addition to uh, in addition to, to all of them, there was also what were known as the Young Turks, who were the young up and coming uh, hot Hollywood stars of the era, who also moved into the canyon and lived and partied amongst the rock stars, uh, people like Bruce Dern and. Dennis Hopper and Peter and Jane Fonda and Sharon Tate and uh, all of those kind of people. Uh, <clears throat> they were all they were all intermingled in the scene, and you know all of them, <laughs> all of them as well. You know Dennis Hopper acknowledged uh, not long before his death that his dad had been a career intelligence operative. <sighs> Um, you know, his official bio says that he was a, like a farmer or, or a rancher <laughs> or something. But according to Dennis Hopper himself, his career sp spanned all the way back to the OSS, pre-CIA, you know. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, he'd been around, he'd been an intelligent oper operative for a very long time. Uh, Bruce Dern's uncle was a skull and bones man. And his godparents were um, Adelaide Stevenson and uh, First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt were his godparents. So, I mean, he was deeply politically connected. Um, you know, it's just, <laughs> it, it's a, uh, Sharon Tate was the daughter of Lieutenant Colonel Paul Tate, U.S. Air Force, I believe, intelligence. You know, and, and even Jane and Peter Fonda's uh, dad, Henry Fonda, did uh, naval intelligence work during World War II. And, That's crazy. And was, it's, it's fucking and crazy. Was related, and was related through marriage to both the Rothschild family and, the, and uh, a top official in the Mussolini regime. See, and it's Despite, not just you're you're not just spouting off names of famous people here. Like there, there's a connection to Laurel Canyon. Like these people are all around the same time in the same place, kind of getting famous together. And oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The actors were just as much a part of the scene as uh, as the musicians. And in fact, there you know a few of the uh, a few of the, the very iconic films of the '60s were were very much a product of Laurel Canyon, including Easy Rider. Um, yeah, was very, very much a, an outgrowth of Laurel Canyon. You know, the two main characters, uh, Dennis Hopper's character was was based on David Crosby, and uh, Peter Fonda's was uh, based on um, supposedly either Graham Parsons or uh, Jim McGuinn. Mm -hmm. And these are all guys that that rode their motorcycle. You know, <laughs> did did. Uh, Routinely, you know, David Crosby had a big Triumph motorcycle that he routinely uh, raced through uh, Laurel Canyon on, dressed in the buckskin jacket and what, you know, looking every, every bit the the, <laughs> the character that you know, and all you know, most of the music in that movie is you know from Laurel Canyon bands like Steppenwolf and the Birds and whatnot, and uh, even parts of it were even filmed there. And uh, same with the trip, the movie The Trip, which was supposed to be a a cinematic version of an acid trip, which, you know, again, starred the same, it was written by Jack Nicholson and starred Peter Fonda and uh, Bruce Dern and uh, was filmed in a house in Laurel Canyon that was later occupied by the band Love. So, huh. so, so all of these people were very closely connected and all very much a part of the scene and, um, and all from very, very similar, you know, family backgrounds. So. Now, now, sticking along that same vein, wasn't there something about the uh, where they were situated, like on some sort of uh, old military base or something like that? Yeah, yeah. that's the other. 
that's the other weird thing is that they also happen to be huddled around a covert military installation that supposedly primarily served as a uh, a covert Hollywood studio. Basically, it was a a covert Hollywood studio. Yeah, it was a full service film studio. Uh, it was <laughs> that's where they shot the moon landing. <laughs> yeah, I believe. I, I think they did the post production work there. Actually, <laughs> um, it was said to be the the world's only full service film uh, film studio that they could do everything in house. You know, by necessity, obviously, because they couldn't really you know farm stuff out. So uh, they had everything: sound stages, you know, temperature controlled film vaults, an animation department, special effects department, a complete. Uh, apps complete you know soup to nuts film studio that was said to be the most advanced in the world just in happened fact, it, to be on an old covert military base and it's claimed that uh you know uh, that some of the technology that later you know drifted out into uh you know mainstream hollywood studios uh was pioneered there some of the you know advanced uh you know visual effects and sound effects and whatnot uh actually began life there. Um, the curious thing is that they claim that the primary purpose of the facility was to process the raw film stock from all of the, uh, the uh, atomic bomb tests of the 50s and 60s, and that uh, that was its primary purpose, was to, um, to process all this raw film stock. But you know, that doesn't really make any sense because why, you know, all you need for that is a dark room. Why would you fly it all the way to a covert facility in Laurel Canyon that, that's equipped to make complete films, you know? <laughs> so obviously there was a whole lot more going on there than what than what they claim. And, you know, it could very well have served as, as something other than, than a film studio as well. But uh it was definitely it was definitely in operation officially till at least 1969, and by some reports uh, beyond that. But it was definitely in full operation um, throughout the mid to late 60s. You know, I mean, the, the scene really started to develop about 64, 65. I think the Birds' first album came out in early 65 or something. That was the one that really sort of set off the whole folk rock revolution and. Um, and the facility was definitely in operation till at least 1969. So for like the first five years, the, the the peak years of this of this scene, it was in full operation. You know, so you had you had personnel reporting to duty in, in this in this studio. You know, right in the midst of of this whole hippie peace, love, and music scene. So. Um, so it was kind of a strange location for yeah. them to, you know, is it, very is more than a little odd that all these sons and daughters of of this very same establishment just chose to huddle around a military facility, you know, hidden up in the Hollywood Hills. Well, so it's funny it's, you should mention the actors because I mean, we are, it's common knowledge these days that the the CIA has you know had their hands in the entertainment industry. Why wouldn't they have gone the music road as well? I wonder if I bet you that Justin Bieber is some up to something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I think pretty much all of Hollywood is controlled these days, and maybe I don't know. Maybe it always was. Uh, it's. Uh, I mean, I I to me, it's kind of it's just sort of the media arm of the CIA, basically. Yeah, <laughs> the yeah propaganda, exactly. The propaganda exactly. arm, maybe I guess you'd call it. I don't know. It's. Uh, yeah, I you know I I think I yeah I think the intelligence community exerts a lot of control over uh, Hollywood and has for a very long time. So have you always thought that is or is that something you kind of fell into as you were writing the book or? No, before that I've you know I've done other research on on Hollywood going all the way back to the earliest days and you know there's just there's always been weird things that go on in Hollywood there's always been unexplained suspicious deaths you know going all the way back to like Thelma Todd and uh, uh, Thomas Ince and you know these people from from like the very earliest days of Hollywood there's been uh, there's been deaths that have been swept under the rug and, and uh, very curious circumstances surrounding those deaths. And uh, it's just, it's just, there's just been a lot of weirdness <laughs> in Hollywood for a very long time, you know? And, uh, 
and 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 people in Hollywood tend to do very strange things at times, you know, that just sort of get people just kind of shrug it off and and you know accept it as business as usual, you know, when like uh, you know Margot Kidder is found like huddled under a bush in somebody's backyard in Glendale, you know, <laughs> or. or uh, and Hayes goes up knocking on somebody's door saying that she's just getting beamed up to the mothership, you know, or Robert Downey Jr. decides to go to sleep in a neighbor's uh, bed <laughs> or, uh, you know, Martin Lawrence runs out on Ventura Boulevard waving a gun and shouting obscenities and shit, you know, <laughs> I mean, stuff like that just happens all the time, you know, and I think there's a reason for that, you know, that, the, that there's so much weirdness going on in Hollywood and so many unexplained deaths and Shia LaBeouf's the new one. What about him? He's going off the deep end. I thought I seen something the other day saying he was going off the deep end. Yeah, there was some video, too, about him talking about uh, phone calls and everything being recorded back in, like, 2009. Oh, wow. Yeah, he's he's been making some really strange public appearances lately. Like, didn't he, like, show up somewhere with, like, a bag over his head Yeah, he just showed up with a bag on his head that said, I'm not a celebrity (laughs) anymore. Yeah, well, you know, I mean... Well, before that, it was Joaquin Phoenix, you know, just uh, just going off on a bender and then saying, ah, that was just all performance art, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Wasn't he saying he was going to be a rapper? I, I mean, it, that was, whole thing was just weird. They did, like, the weird appearance on Letterman, and then they made, like, the sh- very strange movie, and, and then he, you know, and then he's back to normal, and... You know, I mean, it's it's just par for the course, you know. Britney Spears goes nuts and shaves her head and starts speaking with a British accent and, you know, doing all this. And then they ship them off to rehab and get them, you know, give them a quick tune-up or whatever they do. I don't know. And It's like the know. MK Ultra breaking down. I I think it is. Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's – I think it's I, – I honestly believe that, that celebrity rehab centers – and I'm not talking about just rank and file rehab centers where like the, you know, street corner junkie would go or whatever. I'm talking about like the, the Betty Ford center, the Wonderland center, the place where, you know, the Lindsay Lohans and the Britney Spears and whatnot get shipped off. I, I think they, you know, uh, just to, to a large extent, they operate as sort of reprogramming. reprogramming centers I was they, just going to say that. Yeah. Where yeah. they send these people to get, to get them back on, get them back online, you know? <laughs> and, uh, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, that's what it seems like to me, you know? I mean, I don't know how else you explain it. You know, there's, there's these people just go, you know, they just really just, go completely off the deep end and then they ship them off to rehab and a few months later they're back and resuming their careers and everything's fine and yeah it can't and just be scientologists it too. can't just be fame <laughs> either you know like, and the, uh, yeah they say well you know that's just it's because they're in a fishbowl and they're no different from anybody else they're just you know if, if you shown that bright a spotlight on any subculture you'd find all the same stuff but i don't think so because my friends don't do that kind of stuff you know nobody yeah. nobody that i've ever personally known in my life has done anything nearly as weird as what people in hollywood seem to do on a pretty regular basis actually <laughs> you know <laughs> so so getting back to the thread of of, uh, of laurel canyon and the connection like if you were to put your crazy conspiracy hat on and darren this is kind of like question for you too like what is going on with the with the intelligence like if you were to just go completely out there what would be the reason for gathering all this together and creating this this hippie movement i guess i don't even know what to call it there's so many things you could call it but this whole subculture that's where they sit in their roots man i believe I believe that one of the main purposes was to sabotage the anti-war movement, which uh, which had already started uh, before the hippies came along. Which is a lot of one thing that a lot of people don't understand because a lot of people, a lot of people, have, people have a lot of misconceptions about the '60s, and and that's that's quite deliberate, I think. You know, um, one of them being that it, that, that uh, you know San Francisco was the birthplace of all this when it was actually L.A. and the other one being that I think to a very large degree, most people these days 
think of the hippies flower children as being synonymous with the anti-war movement mm. and uh, you know and i did myself for a very long time and but that's not really the case there there, there was a budding anti-war movement <clears throat> that was already in place before the hippies came along and uh and they were none too happy to see the the hippies come in and sort of take over the the game and uh it really began on college campuses you know and and was was basically being led by these very, you know, clean cut, intelligent, uh, you know, college professors, very, you know, respected, uh, respectable, and, uh, you know, very mainstream sort of college uh, professors and their students. And um, in no time at all, they were kind of displaced by the hippies. And the, the new face of the anti war movement became. You know, the, this long haired, you know, bearded, stoned, you know, these people that that to mainstream America, you know, to most of America were just just like at, from another world, you know, I mean, just, you know, to go from from the very sort of conservative uh, stoic 50s to these wild and woolly 60s where all of a sudden you had people with these crazy hairstyles and clothing styles and this this all new music and this, you know, that open drug use and free love and, you know, a whole new lingo. And I mean, everything about it really seems like it was kind of designed to be offensive to mainstream America. And I think that was quite deliberate. I think that that face was quite deliberately. And I, you know, I mean, I grew up thinking of myself as a hippie. So, you know, I mean, I, I had the long hair and the clothes and all that. So, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not looking to bash the hippies. But, you know, I mean, the reality is that to most, to mainstream America, to like Heartland America, uh, you couldn't really have put a more foreign offensive kind of alienating face on the anti-war movement than uh, than what the hippies did and you know i think i think that was that was quite deliberate and like so i say that it was they knew that the war, they, they were already planning on heating up the war and they knew that you know the draft was coming and then uh, there was going to be there was going to be resistance and because right, um, it went on until so like the mid 70s right i think didn't it the war uh, we actually, yeah, we actually, uh, I think we pulled out in 73, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. And, which is another, you know, another, mis in my opinion, anyway, another misconception is that the hippies ended the war. You know, we, you know, you, you talk to these aging hippies and they'll tell you that they won, you know, they got <laughs> like, really? Cause, uh, kind of drug on for 10 years there, you know? And I mean, even after, even after it reached the point where the National Guard was gunning down students at Kent State, it still drug on, you know, that was, I think, 1970. It still drug on for two or three years beyond that. So, you know, the notion that the hippies uh, ended the war, just, I, it doesn't really jive with me. So, um, yeah, I, I think they were put in place specifically to derail the anti-war movement and, and ensure that the war ran its course, basically, um, which it did, you know, well beyond the 60s and, you know, in the, uh, into, uh, I, well, I think it was 1973, wasn't it? That yeah, we 73, finally three or five. I thought it was 75 for some reason, but go ahead. Darren's got, Darren, we're, we're uh, fighting over each other to get in here, get a word in edgewise here. What, what do you got? It Darren? was somewhere in there. Cause I know my, my oldest brother was born in 57 and he was coming up very close to draft age by the time we, uh, cause he was getting nervous. Oh he always, yeah. Yeah. 18 or whatever. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He had like a year or two to go, I think, when we finally pulled out and uh, and they they stopped the uh, they stopped the draft for many years after that. Yeah. So, but yeah, he was getting a little nervous there. <laughs> I remember. That's so so yeah, it was. Uh, I I don't know. I want I want to say seventy three, but it might have been seventy five. You might be right. I'm not sure. Yeah, the way I I figure that's just because that's when they fucking figured out that they could do this. And that's why, like, you see little heat. Like, that's why I think you're able to find evidence of it back at back those days. Like these days, I think they're still up to the same stuff, but they've got it so perfected that we don't know. Like, you're not finding the stuff that Dave's dug up because the '60s. That's when they were, you know, they're killing people and they're just trying to get cover their tracks, kind of. Exactly, or they're just kind of learning how to do it, and now they've got them all mind controlled. I and 
I I agree. I, yeah, you know, one one of the, one of the things that another question that I get quite a bit, and people will ask me, well, are you saying that these people had no talent? You know, that they were just, uh, <laughs> you know, no talent bums that were that were only in 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 the position that they were in because of who they were. And no, I'm not saying. You know, I mean, I I still listen to that music myself almost daily. You know, I grew up on it. It was you know the soundtrack to my my early years. You know, and. Um, you know, I recognize that some of these guys were just, I think some of them were overrated, but some of them were just like hugely talented, just amazingly talented artists. And um, I don't, I don't know that you could say that today. You know, I don't, there's such a huge disconnect now between the level of fame and, you know, critical, uh, response and actual talent you know i mean you you look at these these stars now that just sort of come out pre-packaged out of nowhere and have these huge like out of nowhere have these huge international fan bases and you know tens of millions of hits on their videos and whatnot and you know, I, I don't really think that that can be explained purely in terms of talent. If you're, you know, looking at like a Miley Cyrus or a Lady Gaga or a Justin Bieber or, you know, whoever the flavor of the month is. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's just there's a huge disconnect nowadays between talent and, and the level of fame and recognition that these people achieve in such a, a short period of time. And uh, yeah, I think, you know, they've had 50 years of practice from 1964 to now. And I think it, the star making machine has developed to the point now where talent is almost kind of secondary. You know, if you got a marketable, if, if they can give you a marketable face and image, they can make you a star, you know? And, um, so yeah, in, in a way the sixties were, were kind of the golden, the golden, <laughs> the golden era. Cause although I do believe it was very much controlled, uh, talent was still, you know, very much a part, a part of the equation to a much larger extent than, than I believe it is now. You know, I just, I don't know. I look at these artists now and I just, I just don't see anybody that has that level of, uh, you know, like, like a Frank Zappa or a, or a, a Brian Wilson who was just, I mean, these guys were just phenomenally talented as composers, musicians, producers, arrangers. I mean, just, you know, Brian, uh, Brian Wilson from the age of 19 was like given complete creative control over his music. It was like unprecedented. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he, he wrote it all, performed it, arranged it, produced it, you know, uh, the vocals, the, most of the instruments. I mean, just an amazingly talented guy. And, uh, I, I don't know that there's a lot of people like that around these days, you know? Um, not that I can see, anyway. So let's let's say that your theory is is correct for for this example here. We we just talked to a guest uh, earlier, and we were talking about the uh, expansion of our consciousness, like sort of going along with the expansion of the internet and how we're really challenging the scientific paradigm and this type of thing. And he he equated some of that expansion of consciousness to the hippie movement, actually, that just happened tonight. And do you think that it? So if you're right with your theory. Um, do you think that it, in some ways it backfired and that it did create um, a culture of love, let's say? 
Um, you know, that's an interesting question. Um, that, that, that comes up all the time, particularly in regards to, to LSD. You know, I mean, most people that have done their homework know that it originated with the intelligence community and, and was researched as a, through the MK ultra project, various MK ultra, ultra sub projects. It was, uh, you know, uh, people were dosed without their knowledge and whatnot. And, uh, so most people, you know, recognize that it was a product of the intelligence community and was likely deliberately introduced into the community, but then there's considerable debate about whether it backfired or not. You know, did it achieve its purpose or did it actually end up enlightening people and yeah, expanding yeah. their consciousness? And, you know, that'll probably always be a debate. Um, I, I think it worked much be- worked out much better than, than a lot of people seem to think so. Um, better for them? You know, I... I uh, yeah, I, I think it served its purposes to a larger extent than most people seem to think. Because I mean, basically, I mean, to me, you know, the, the whole the whole hippie, uh, you know, the the whole hippie philosophy was was kind of uh, you can't fix the world, you know, you you can't, you know, there, there's no way you could fix all this. So the you know the the solution is to sort of create your own. Uh, create your own little slice of paradise, you know, go off to a commune and, uh, you know, you can't fix everything else in the world, but you can just, you know, go off in your own little commune and uh, create your own little, your own little paradise, your own little, your own little private paradise, which is great, you know, for the group involved, you know, uh, assuming it doesn't descend into a Manson situation, you know, Um, but that's not really the, the answer to stopping a war or, or achieving any kind of real meaningful, you know, social change. And, you know, tied in with that was the whole, the whole LSD thing and, and Leary's, uh, you know, often repeated, you know, turn on, tune in, drop out. So, you know, I mean, the, the message to a large degree that the hippies were getting and sending out was was not to try to fix society, but to drop out from society and form your own little utopia, you know? And, you know, as, t- as, as good of an idea as that seemed at the time, it was really counterproductive to, uh, to stopping a war and, and achieving real, you know, uh, change on a society-wide level. So I, I think it was more effective um, than what a lot of people seem to think. But, you know, again, that, that that's... That will probably always be a point of debate whether it, uh, you know, backfired did, and, and if so, to what extent. I was going to ask you about the drug scene. Did did you come across a lot of that uh, in the in your research at Laurel Canyon? Like, um, was that a part of this whole thing? I mean, everybody well, thinks I, it was, but Owsley was a big part of it. Uh, he was he was the big acid chemist, you know. The, um, who was uh, stationed up in San Francisco, who was supplying just just unbelievable amounts of, uh, putting just uh, unfathomable amounts of LSD on the streets and oftentimes for free. You know, he's the guy that anytime there was a big festival going on, whether it was uh, Altamont or Monterey or the Human Bee Inn or, you know, any, any big music festival or big hippie gathering, he, you know, he pretty reliably showed up to distribute free acid, you know, like sometimes thousands, tens of thousands of hits, you know, dosing the entire crowd. And, you know, he always said that, uh, that his motives, you know, and, and most most people who knew him say that his motives were purely benevolent, that, you know, he was just, he wanted to turn on the world. He thought this was a great experience and he wanted everybody to to be a part of it, you know. But given the, the his, his background, which was also, you know, very strange and, uh, you know, his family background involves various politicians and he himself did radio intelligence work. And, you know, he's got he's got a very curious backstory himself. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, the question could could be raised. Was was he really the benevolent, you know, Johnny Appleseed, you know, running around the country, giving everybody free acid just because he was a, a good guy or. Or was he, you know, was this all a part of a planned, you know, operation to, you know, affect whatever changes it was they wanted to make in the youth culture? So, you know, there's a lot of open questions, you know, and, and I, I think there's, in, in a lot of these cases, there is 
there is room for you know reasonable people to disagree over the effectiveness of you know what whether these things had effect or not. I tend to think that they that they largely did succeed in their goals, but uh, you know other people disagree. So, I wonder if he was just a, that. almost like some sort of weird <laughs> social experiment where they want to see the effects of dousing you know mass amounts of people with LSD. Maybe they were planning on dropping acid I- on the Russians. I, I, yeah, I think it was social engineering on a large, I mean, to me, you know, uh, Woodstock, especially Woodstock seems to me like a, just a big giant open air, uh, MK ultra operation, (laughs) you know, you know, I mean, you had these people that were basically trapped there, you know, once they got there, they couldn't get out because their cars were, were boxed in by 8 million other friggin' cars. You know, I mean, these, these people were basically prisoners there. They had like almost no fucking sanitation to speak of. They were deprived of food. They were deprived of water. They were deprived of sleep for, you know, like days on end. They were fed acid. They had this rock music just constantly, you know, going like almost 24 seven for like three days. And I mean, to me, the whole thing just sounds like, uh, you know, it doesn't really sound like that pleasant of an experience, you know, for a lot of these people, it just, it seems like they were kind of human Guinea pigs, you know, I'm trying to picture the, the military industry, like the higher ups in the military industrial complex with this whole Laurel, Laurel Canyon thing, right? Like, Okay, we've got like what is it? A bunch of them in the in a dark smoky room going, "Okay, we've got this old military base right near LA. Let's turn it into a studio, send all these all these people we know there, like all these connections we have with people that are, have uh, you know, kids that are aspiring musicians or maybe not even. Like I I just can't uh I can't grasp how that would all happen with such a diverse backgrounds in the in the intelligence community. And then did these people, did all the, the musicians themselves, like, were they uh, musicians from kids or did they, were a lot of them like turned on to this at the last minute? Do you, do you know? Turned on? Yeah. MK um, style. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it varies. Um, some of, you know, some, some of them were, were in the music from a very young age. Jim Morrison was probably the most unlikely rock star to ever walk on a stage. Um, he himself has said in interviews that uh, he never had any previous interest in music and that uh, he didn't, he rarely listened to music, that he'd only been to, you know, one or two live uh, concerts in his life. He'd only seen like one or two bands ever play live didn't listen much to music, never learned to read or write music, never learned to play an instrument. He said he never even sung. In one interview, he said, I'd never even conceived of the notion that I could open my mouth and make sounds come out. No, I think he was, he was more, he considered himself more of a poet, I think. Yeah. So, I mean, he had no musical background whatsoever and no, even, even by his own account, no interest in uh, pursuing music. And then out of nowhere, and I, I have a picture of him uh, in the book, uh, seeing his father off. There, he's he's uh, standing side by side with his dad on the bridge of the, his father's ship, the USS Bonham Richard, right before he set sail for Southeast Asia. And uh, Jim was there seeing him off, and I mean, you'd never even recognize him. He, he's this short-haired, clean-cut, very collegiate, conservative-looking kid, you know, there alongside his admiral dad. And then, like, a year or two later, he emerged into this completely different persona, and suddenly he's a rock star, even though he'd had no previous training or interest in music whatsoever. Next thing you know, he's writing songs and... Uh, He's this larger than life rock star. So uh, in some of the cases, they definitely seem to just sort of come out of nowhere. Uh, but, you know, in other cases, uh, you know, they, they, some of them were definitely very skilled musicians, you know. Um, but, but some of them, you, you know, like the, the Birds, the, the very first band that, that came out that, that really ignited the whole scene, um, it was like almost as contrived as the monkeys, you know, <laughs> you had, you had five guys in there and only one of them was considered a very proficient musician, which was Jim McGuinn, the lead guitarist, the 12 string guitarist who was, uh, who was widely regarded as a very good guitarist. But, uh, 
the guy that that uh, they put on bass, Chris Hillman, was a formerly he was a musician, but he was a bluegrass mandolin player. He'd never played a bass guitar in his life, and the uh, the drummer Michael Clark uh, had never never picked up a pair of drums. He'd played bongo drums on the beach. That was his past drumming experience. The guy had never picked up a, a pair of drumsticks. So literally their entire rhythm section had never even played their instruments before, before signing with the band. They'd never even, <laughs> never even played those instruments. And, uh, you know, David Crosby and uh, Gene Clark were just passable as guitarists. Uh, their parts were played by session musicians on the albums. Um, so the only one that actually played on their initial albums was uh, the only one of the five was Jim McGuinn. Every, all, all the rest of it was done by studio musicians because they, they, they had no idea how to play their instruments really. And yet they were the, they were the ones who, who blazed the trail for all the other bands to follow. You know, they were, they were the first ones out of the gate, the ones who, who, who pioneered the whole folk rock uh, sound and um, just completely contrived, you know? I mean, they, they hardly wrote any of the, most of the music on their first album was uh, covers of like Bob Dylan and, and other uh, folk, uh, folk singer songs. Like half the album, I think, was like Dylan tunes. Hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, their whole first album was created by taking other people's music, having it recorded by studio musicians, and then having them layer their vocals on top of it. That was basically their contribution to the album. And, uh, and, and that was the album that, that, that started this whole ball rolling, you know, <laughs> and it could not possibly have been more contrived, you know? I mean, this was not like these five musicians that came together and said, Hey, we ought to form this band. And, you know, I'm a ba I play bass. What do you, play? you know, it was it wasn't like that at all. I mean, it was like these people were basically cast to be in this band. And, uh, so, you know, there's a very contrived uh, flavor to a lot of the, the first bands that came out of there that, that just sort of came together much too quickly and, and not really in, in the way that you would think a, a band would sort of organically form. And then all you need is some influence in the radio and the media to just push it, push it like they do these days with all the music and then uh, instant, instant stardom and then I guess the start of that whole musical kind of revolution. Wasn't it pretty well the same studio musicians that were doing um, it was. the covers it was the for wreck, almost yeah. all of them? It was the Wrecking Crew. It, well, yeah, Hal Blaine on the drums, Carol Kay on bass, uh, Leon Russell actually on keyboards, uh, Glenn Campbell, believe it or not, played a lot of the guitar parts. Um, Larry Nectel was... Uh, what did he do? He was a something. I don't know. But it, yeah, it was uh, it was this team of very crack uh, studio musicians known as the Wrecking Crew who were in very high demand, who uh, who played on a lot of a lot of a lot of their uh, their records, actually. And um, actually, I read a quote not long ago from uh, a drummer from uh, a fairly contemporary band. It wasn't like a real huge band. Real. Uh, I, think it, I think it was the, the drummer from Toto or something like that. And uh, the quote was basically, uh, I, don't, I don't know, I don't have it verbatim, but he basically said uh, that he was devastated to learn that his 10 favorite drummers from, <laughs> for, of all time were all the same guy, <laughs> Hal Blaine. Because, oh, yeah, I mean, they... They played the they played on the on the Beach Boys albums. They played on the Birds albums. They played on the Mamas and the Papas. They played on the Turtles. I mean, they were all of these. Ba you know, I mean, to this day, all that music that's on those landmark albums is you know that that people assume was played by the people pictured on the cover. Uh, yeah, it was all actually played uncredited uh, to the wreck the Wrecking Crew uh, to to an amazing degree. How many? how many of these iconic songs that we all know and love uh, were actually played by this group of, of at the time, anonymous uh, studio musicians. And, and, and which, is one of the reasons, which is one of the reasons that the monkeys, you know, I, I, I always, you know, I, throw, I toss in the monkeys when I'm doing these interviews with, with all these other bands. And, you know, every once in a while, someone will 
be kind of shocked like well, why would you throw in a you know obviously fake contrived band like the monkeys with you know all of these hugely talented bands but the reality is that the monkeys were very much accepted as part of the you know musical fraternity the musical community and uh were very much a part of the scene and you know if you look through pictures from that era you'll see you know, like uh, Mickey Dolan's hanging out with David Crosby and and, uh, and Eric Clapton in Mama Cass's front yard. And you're like, what the hell is Mickey Dolan's doing there? <laughs> <You know>? but, <laughs> but he was very much accepted as a part of the scene. And, and a big reason for that is that these musicians knew something that the public didn't, which is that it wasn't only the Monkees albums that these guys were playing on. The very same people were recording their albums as well. You know, <laughs> in the so, in the turnkey studio that used to be a covert military base. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, there was a, a lot of elements that, that just seemed very uh, sort of contrived, you know, and, and not uh, and the speed with you know the, the you know I mean you think of a sort of a gra like the folk music that preceded it that was much more of an organic you know movement that started with these you know starving artists who were you know struggling to you know get gigs at coffee houses and you know if they're really lucky they might get a little airplay on college radio and you know slowly but surely maybe try to work their way into the mainstream but these guys i mean some of them within like days or weeks of landing in Laurel Canyon, all of a sudden they had bands, they had contracts, they had recording space, they had rehearsal space, they had new instruments and they were, you know, they were getting promoted by big name labels like Capitol and Columbia. I mean, these weren't, you know, they, that's another thing. They weren't signed by like indie, you know, labels. They were signed by the biggest labels in the country, you know, and promoted by the biggest radio stations. And um, so, you know, it was very much corporate, big, big, you know, big time corporate money that was backing these people right from the start. You know, they, did, they didn't have to go through the, the, the starving artist period. You know, they, did, they didn't have to suffer for their art, so to speak. Yeah, that, that makes more sense now that I, did, I didn't realize that those, those record labels were backing them either. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they, yeah, they signed immediately to like Columbia Capital, uh, you know, I mean, all, virtually all of these uh, Electra, you know, I mean, they, they all signed, you know, um, right away. I mean, there was no like intermediary step where they started off with a small label and then after a couple albums, they got picked up by Capital or whatever. No, they, I mean, they were signed right off the bat, you know, and um so yeah, it doesn't. It you know the more the more the elements you look at, the less and less organic it, it starts to feel. And there's another uh, element too that we didn't touch on yet that I'd like to before we run out of time is uh, the fashion and the the party, uh, was it like the L.A. dance scene or something like that you were talking about. Oh, uh, the freak seat, yeah, the uh, Vito and his uh, dance crew who are largely credited by a lot of people on the scene as being literally the, the first hippies. Um, there was this guy who the name was Vito, who was quite a bit older than the rest of the crowd. He was already like into his fifties, whereas, you know, most of these guys were barely out of their teens. And, uh, he had a group, he was kind of a Manson-y kind of character. Actually, he had a he had sort of this large entourage, many of whom were attractive underage girls. And um, so like Charlie, he was kind of a real popular guy to have around because he always brought these young, attractive, ready, willing, and able young women along with him, you know, which, uh, which, which made, which is why Charlie was more than welcome to spend the whole summer with Dennis Wilson, you know, um, because uh, so Vito was very much in that same mold. He uh, he had this this whole entourage of of uh, largely young, attractive women and and, uh, and guys as well. And they are largely credited with with uh, with being the first hippies, with with creating the whole the hairstyles, the clothing styles, the whole sort of attitude. And uh, and they were like a freeform dance troupe that would go out to the clubs and. Um, and they created quite a spectacle. They uh, they were actually, you know, as popular and in some cases more popular than the bands themselves. 
uh, and they were they were one of the the ways in which these bands were first initially uh, uh, achieved the audiences that they did because when they first started out, you know, LA didn't have a music scene. That's or not much of a music scene. That's another strange thing is that um, you know when wow. these bands congregate congregating in Laurel Canyon, LA was not considered really much of a music center. They didn't didn't have a, a huge live music scene, didn't have a uh, a big recorded music scene, and the industry actually grew up around all of these artists. Um, so that's another thing that that is kind of weird that the, the the industry followed the artists rather than the artists going to where the industry was. So <laughs> another thing that's curious that they decided to settle in LA, but, but anyway, so, uh, no sooner did these bands arrive and start getting signed, then, uh, all of these clubs started to pop up Ciro's and the whiskey, a go, go and the kaleidoscope and the London fog and Beto Lido's and numerous others that are long forgotten now just sprung up all along sunset strip. And so, um, you know, suddenly you had all of these, these venues there for, for all these bands to play. And I just completely lost. Where, where was I? Oh, Vito. <laughs> I, I think you're t- going to oh, talk Vito. about uh, Vito. Okay. So, yeah. So, um, so the, but the thing was that the, these clubs were, a lot of these clubs were brand new. They did not, nobody knew, you know, anything about these clubs. They had no clientele and these bands were brand new. They were just coming out. Nobody really knew them. And so the way that the, uh, the way that the club promoters got people into the clubs was by recruiting these dancers to come into their clubs and create this, this big public spectacle on the dance floor. And which was, you know, uh, very widely publicized. And the other, uh, the other thing was, was the young Turks, which we talked about earlier, who were also widely publicized to be out hitting these clubs on a regular basis. So, um, the the uh, the draw and and I have a lot of quotes in the book from people who were on the scene, including even some of the band members themselves, saying, "Yeah, you know, the the people weren't coming to see us. They were they were coming to, for a chance to you know to see uh, Jane Mansfield or you know a chance to rub shoulders with uh, Peter Fonda and to watch this crazy, insane, you know, drug fueled spectacle going on on the dance floor and." Uh, and so that's that's what really put some of these clubs on the map initially and, and got the people out there and onto the strip to see these bands was uh, was this this uh, this group of freak dancers. And um, so they were, although largely forgotten now and only mentioned in passing in most of the literature about the scene, uh, they were considered, you know, hugely influential in uh in really getting the scene off the ground and uh, they're very closely tied to the birds that Vito studio was actually the birds rehearsal space. So he, he was one of the key players in, in launching the very first band from and the beginning. Then, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, from right from the beginning, uh, he and his group were, were really hugely influential in getting this scene going and raising public awareness of the, and then when the went on the road, <laughs> for the first time, the first band out of L.A. to go on a nationwide tour, they actually took a uh, portion of the troupe with them on the road and would have them dance for them in these clubs in, like, middle America. And it was uh, it was uh, to a lot of, uh, you know, people in various uh, corners of the country, it was their very first exposure to what would soon be known as the, you know, hippie culture. Um, they were they were the first ones to to get out there and uh, go on the road, so to speak, and and uh, start introducing this whole thing, not just in L.A. but all around the country. You know, so yeah, they they were they were hugely influential and almost completely forgotten now, and very difficult to dig up much information on them, really, <laughs> considering what you know what a key role they had, they did play in in getting this whole scene off the ground. You know, it's funny because it makes perfect sense because you're talking about the the young Turks being involved and the young actors because you can kind of you can force your way into show business in a way back then. You know what I mean? Like you make the movies, so you decide who's on the screen. But music, you kind of you can't really force it, so you kind of combine the three different aspects to kind of massage it into people until you know they learn to associate it all as one. 
Yeah, yeah, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so is there, is there anything else uh, that we've that we've left out as far as like sort of big stuff that the listeners should know about? Um I don't know. I'm sure there is. Yeah. Um <clears throat> it gets pretty deep. You know, there's a lot yeah, the, the, there's a lot of detail in the book. Um you know, one of uh I don't know if we've, we've talked about this at the beginning, but I'm sure you guys know that it, that it began life as a web series uh, in 2008, and I worked on it as a, as basically as a, as a series of uh, blog posts for like four or five years to up until like 2012, 2013, something like that when I, when I uh, signed the book contract. And um, the benefit of that is that uh, the book is much more richly detailed than it would have been because I uh, got so much feedback from readers as I was going along, you know, and I'd write about some specific person or event or, or place or whatever, and then I'd get all kinds of feedback. Hey, did you know that this guy also did this or he also knew so-and-so or his dad was this, you know? And so I benefited greatly from... Uh, from all the feedback from my readers and uh, was able to make this a much more richly detailed story than, than it would have been. So, um, yeah, it's packed with all kinds of names and dates and places and, and uh, various threads that run through it. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's hard to get everything in there, but I, I think, I think we covered most of the, uh, most of the main points pretty much. And you were talking to us at the beginning before we started recording about I I, I think you're pretty happy with the uh, how this book has taken off so far. I am overwhelmed and <laughs> a bit humbled and uh, still wondering if it's actually happening because oh I my God. Do, yeah it's I um uh, yeah I'm just am, I'm amazed I'm amazed by how many Amazon reviews I've gotten I'm amazed at the, at how well the sales seem to be going. Um, just the overwhelmingly positive response that I've gotten by email and, and through the book's uh, Facebook page and whatnot. I mean, there's some haters in the crowd, but, you know, I, I, I knew that, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah. I knew that going into it. That's, uh, that goes with the territory, you know, not everybody's going to love it. There's definitely going to be some haters, but uh, they're vastly outnumbered at this point by the the people who just have been heaping praise on it, Al almost to an embarrassing degree. Actually, some of the some of the introductions that some of the radio hosts have given me lately, I'm just like, really? Are you, are you, are you sure you're introducing me? You know, I mean, uh, <laughs> like introducing me like I'm a rock star, you know, and. Yeah, I, uh, I I'm still trying to get used to to uh, to all the attention and all the all the all the the rave reviews I've been getting. So, um, of course, you know a lot a lot of the earliest readers were are my hardcore fans who followed it online and were chomping at the bit to get it as soon as it, you know, as soon as it re it was released and. You know, as more as more time goes by and the word of mouth gets out there, it, it's getting more into the hands of uh, people who aren't, you know, familiar with the material or with me. So um, it gets gets decidedly more mixed reactions from, <laughs> from from those people than than it does from my, you know, my hardcore followers. So um, but so far, I just yeah, I couldn't couldn't really be happier with the with the reception that it's gotten, and uh, I'm I'm shocked and and thrilled and overwhelmed and everything else at this point. So can, um, I'm just gonna ride this wave as long as I can, and uh, you know, see where it goes. Are you are you working on anything new, or do you have anything any any plans for for something new in the future? <sighs> The, mostly I've been working on the Lincoln assassination, which uh, doesn't s seem to resonate with people nearly <laughs> to the it's, it's definitely a, a big step down from Laurel Canyon. I don't know. Maybe a uh, maybe I'll uh, maybe this will be like a you know, this will be like my uh, my book that I can never again equal or something. You know, this will be my this is like my. Uh, 
I don't know what parallel yeah, I'm trying. Yeah, I'm trying to think of that word too. That <laughs> like the like the you know like the, the the you know like Michael Jackson you know can never your, top Thriller, your right? Thriller, he, yeah. This is your you thriller. know. I mean, once once he put that out, that was it because he was never going to be able to top that again, match or top that. You know, so I I don't know. Maybe this is my Thriller. Maybe this is <laughs> well, maybe think, this is good, as good as it gets. I don't know. I think <laughs> we'll you've see. really uncovered uncovered uh, some stuff here, though, right? That people just weren't aware of like hitting something like the Lincoln assassination where people have, you know, already kind of given you the facts between the, the commonalities between uh, Kennedy and Lincoln and the crazy synchronicities there. But you're yeah. really, you're really hitting a nerve uh, and resonating with people on this one. Everybody well, knows yeah, about that's... the hippie movement and nobody probably knows about the, what you've uncovered here. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of that, actually, that, uh, you know, little old me, the, uh, you know, I'm very unprofessional journalist with no, you know, no, no real journalistic training and uh, no network of connections or anything else, managed to dig up this story that had been lying dormant, you know, completely untold for 40 years, you know, before I dipped into it in 2008, it was completely fresh, unplowed ground, you know. Your mom and dad uh, don't work for the CIA, do they? No. <laughs> no, my, they're, they're uh, both retired public school teachers, actually. Okay, my, dad, okay. my dad was a woodshop teacher, and uh, my, mom, uh, my mom was a stay-at-home mom until my brothers and I got into, like, junior high, and then she went back to college and got her teaching degree and uh, taught for a while also in the same district as my dad. Yeah, that'd be my a family, let down. My family background is kind of boring, actually. Yeah, well, that's good. That's important, I think, for this book. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, yeah, I'm uh, I'm very I'm very proud of the work I did, and uh, yeah, I don't you know I don't I don't know that I I don't know that I could could ever could ever equal this again because I mean how many how many stories are there like that that have been you know just lying there uh, undisturbed for, for that long, you know? Yeah. That's um, definitely a once in a lifetime. Yeah. You know? So, uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I shot my wad and, uh, <laughs> that's the, you know, I, <laughs> but I don't know, you know, I mean, I, I wasn't looking for a story when Laurel Canyon came along, you know, yeah. I mean, I just stumbled on it completely by accident and then voila, here's this story. You know, I don't, I don't even remember what I had been previously working on, probably nine one one or something. And, and, uh, at first it just seemed like a, uh, you know, a, a little distraction that I'd look into for a while and then get back to whatever it was. So you never know, you know, you never know what, what, what you could stumble across, you know, I mean, I could be on the, the trail of something completely different six months from now so you just never really know well we'll hope for the latter so we can hear <laughs> all about it uh down the road a lot of people keep have been asking about a sequel actually i've gotten a lot of you know people like you need you really need to do the same thing with the british invasion or you need to do the same thing with the punk and new wave movement or oh, you, need to, you know you need to do the same thing with the seattle scene with you know the grunge, yeah, and i was thinking the grunge. grunge scene and you know i'm like yeah i could spend the rest of my life digging into well, the, know, there, the there's, dark there's one, side of the music industry yeah, but you well, know there's one that we've talked about on the show that's kind of in parallel to what you did, and it, and it's fascinating whether you whether you're uh, into this type of thing or not. But it's called Alien Rock, and a guy wrote a book on all the rock stars influenced by their UFO or crazy like extraterrestrial encounters, and and the list is massive. It kind of reminds me of a, a thread that you've picked on here, where it's just this hidden hidden influence on uh, popular rock stars. Really, is Graham Parsons in there? Because I know he, uh, that was one of his, he, you know, he died out in Joshua Tree, I'm sure, as I'm sure you probably know. Uh, but um, that was one of his favorite pastimes by a variety of reports was to uh, go out to Joshua Tree, drop acid, and uh, watch for UFOs. Which, you know, I'm thinking if you're going to watch for UFOs, that's probably a pretty good way to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, he probably is. Like the the list is is huge too, right? I mean, there's all, and there's guys like uh, what one of the Van Halen guys is coming out now, and people are starting to come out now talking about their their beliefs in this. So it's it's kind of one of those things that's uh, helping uh, you know again evolve our consciousness. Yeah, should... I, I, w- I wasn't really familiar with that, but uh, yeah, I'll, I know that Graham Parsons was a, uh, a big devotee of, uh, of that. And because I, I don't know, you, you, go, you drop enough acid, I don't know how you're ever going to know if you actually saw a UFO or not, man, because you could pretty much see anything you want to see, you know? Exactly. So, <laughs> but um, yeah, he's, I know, I, I don't, I, I didn't come across anything else uh, among the Laurel Canyon people, but then again, I wasn't specifically looking for that. So, um, did you did yeah, you find anything on the twenty seven? You know how you, people are always talking about how all these people are dying at twenty seven. Ah, well, I mean, there there was there was definitely some additions, you know, from Laurel Canyon. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, certainly Jim Morrison, you know, being the most uh, the most famous of them. Uh, what the significance of that is, I I'm not really sure. You know, I mean, it does seem to happen quite a bit, and uh, even today, you know, to this day, you know, you get people like Kurt Cobain and you know Amy Winehouse and whatnot. Um, I, there could be nothing to it, you know. And I mean. It's, uh, you know, it's quite possible that if you picked out some other random age, you could find 10 or 12, uh, you know, major rock stars that died at that age, too. You know, I don't know. Maybe it's just a much ado about nothing. I'm, I don't know. Um, I don't know that the number, does the number 27 have particular occult significance? You know, if not, it was not 33, that I three, it'd be cool. <laughs> well, see, that's that's been that's kind of one of my sort of operating theories is that twenty seven is three cubed, three to the third power, which written oh. out looks like the number thirty three. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I, I'm not a numerolo- I'm not a numerology guy. I know there are a lot of people that really get into that kind of stuff, but that's the one thing that has occurred to me is that 27 can be written as three to the third power, which obviously looks like 33. So, you know, maybe that's something, I don't know. I love it. I was trying to think of that myself, but <laughs> I, I couldn't get there. Yeah. That's, I think that's a perfect, perfect way to fucking wrap up. I like it. <laughs> so yeah, we'll link to all your stuff in the show notes and, uh, yeah, we just really want to thank you for coming on and, and, uh, we're, you know, hopefully, uh, you have a safe and, and long fun ride on the wave here. Uh, I hope so. You know, I mean, I keep wondering when, when it's going to end, you know, I'm like, this, this isn't, you it's know, it's going to be a while, end. you know, I mean, I'm still selling books, you know, I'm, I'm selling uh, signed books directly through my website and, uh, it's slowed down somewhat, you know, I mean, there was a pretty mad rush originally, but I'm still making trips to the post office every day. I don't think I've missed a single day since the book was released and uh, I'm still getting interview requests on a pretty regular basis. And, you know, but I, I keep, you know, I realize at some point it's just going to suddenly die out and, you know, the book sales are going to slowly die, you know, crawl to a stop and the interview requests are going to stop coming in and people are going to move on to the next uh, thing, you know, but uh, I'm, I'm going to try to write it as long as I can. <laughs> So uh, we'll see how it goes. Well, congratulations. It's, it's well-deserved. Well, we'd like, we'd like to really thank you for coming on the show and we'll make sure uh, we link to your website and, and the book and everything else in the show notes. Are, are you on the Twitter or the, Oh, you said you had a I, Facebook page for the book. Right? I am not on Twitter. I am not a big fan of social media. Uh, my, my publisher insisted that, that uh, social media is a, a key, um, a key part of any, you know, sort of grassroots marketing campaign these days and, uh, put leaned on me to open, to start up a Facebook page, which I was reluctant to do, but I <laughs> did. And, uh, it's been quite, it's been a learning experience. Cause I, you know, I didn't, I, I, I didn't know about like trolls and, and, <laughs> you know, the, the trials and tribulations of administering a, you know, controversial, uh, you know, uh, Facebook page. It's, um, 
not hasn't gone exactly as I had hoped uh, in every way, but I mean that's been really rewarding as well. I think I have like sixteen hundred followers on there. You know, after the the book's been out for what barely two months now. It came out April thirtieth, and uh, and I got yeah I got like sixteen hundred. Well, you know, which I'm sure I obviously pales. I'm sure Miley Cyrus has like twelve million followers. You know, so, but but uh, to me that's a pretty big deal. You know, to 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 have have 1600 facebook followers when i've never even done facebook before so uh but no they, they wanted me to set up a twitter account also but i i i, I honestly i don't even know how that works I'm, i i know nothing about twitter i to, I, I always kind of looked at it as I thought it was just sort of there to feed the egos of celebrities, you know, so they could compete to see who had the most followers or something you know <laughs> i think Do you Bieber guys has the most does he? Do you guys have? Do you guys do Twitter? I mean, is it actually a useful tool? Darren, or? Darren does. He he's uh yeah he uses it quite a bit actually. It's it is a, a useful tool for him. I'm I'm not on Facebook or Twitter, so I totally know what you mean. Yeah, I I was very reluctant to to dive into the uh, and the the page that I set up for myself so that I could set up the group page. I actually set up as my dog's page, so the picture and all the. All the biographical details are actually my dogs because uh, I'm just, you know, I mean, I, I know they already got all my info, but I don't want to just hand it to them. You know, I mean, if, if the <laughs> fucking NSA wants my data, they should at least have to work for it. I shouldn't just, you know, just hand it to them on a goddamn. Oh, here you go. What else do you want? To know? <laughs> you know, at least work for my data. Don't, you know. So yeah, I'm not a big fan of social media at all, and I I, I kind of doubt that I'll go and go the Twitter mode. But uh, you can find me on Facebook if you're already on there. Uh, just search for it's just Facebook.com Weird Scenes Inside the Canyon, all is one word. Or I'm sure if you just go on Facebook and search for Weird Scenes Inside the Canyon, it'll pop right up. And uh, if you're a Facebook type person, that's where you can. Uh, that's where I'm. I'm keeping all the updates on the book, as far as you know, interview schedule, any personal appearances, um, various pictures that I've taken. You know, kind of the the visual cues that go with the book, and uh, all that kind of stuff is uh, is on the Facebook page. So if anybody's interested in learning more about it, uh, that's that's pretty much the place to go. I wonder what the slur for a Facebooker would be. The what? The slur? The what slur. do you mean? Oh. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that, I'm at a loss. <laughs> well, <laughs> they, well, we'll link to all that anyways, Dave. And so so for all our listeners, like Dave's Facebook page. And, and uh, yeah, good luck with the rest of your sales. And, yeah, it's uh, we're, we'll keep an eye on your journey. All right. Well, thank you for having me. And uh, good talking to you guys. And best, best of luck to you and all of your endeavors. Then I saw her face Now I'm a believer Not a trace A doubt in my mind I'm in love I'm a believer I couldn't leave her if I tried Disappointments haunted all my dreams And then I saw her face Now I'm a believer Not a trace A doubt in my mind I'm in love I'm a believer I couldn't leave her if I tried And welcome back to the Great America Show. That was our fascinating, crazy chat with Dave McGowan. These are the days I know. Yeah, that was a good one. Uh, I can't wait to actually, uh, we'll have to have Dave on again because it just seems like he's another one of those guests where it seems like you're just sort of scratching the surface. Yeah, you know what we didn't get into much? He started off uh, talking about this and, and I hadn't really heard 
this to that level before, but all the all the the deaths and the murders, right? Do you do you wish we would have got into that a little bit more, or did you, are you okay just leaving it as it was? No, it would have been good to get into, but I mean that that again could be a a whole episode in itself. Yeah. Did you think? What did you think about that? Was there some sort of trend? Or well, co- think it's coincidence exactly, on that? Exactly what I mentioned in the episode that it was just, you know, new uh new intelligence agencies or what have you getting their, their feet wet and learning how to how to play the game that they play so well today. Hmm. Not today they're not as sloppy. Oh yeah, right, you did say that. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Yeah, I, I kinda would I could see that. It's just hard to imagine the amount of work that would take just to say we're going to try and start up some fringe movement to discredit the war so that we can discredit them. Maybe there's more to it than that. Maybe that's why everyone's a slave these days because the doors fucking hypnotized them. We're all MK Ultra. <laughs> <laughs> You've heard break on through to the other side. You are a fucking MK Ultra fucking waiting to go off. Who knows what the queue is? I went through a Doors phase. I'm still in my Doors phase. I know. That's why I bought you that shirt. JMO. So, yeah, that was... Oh, man, that was a great chat. So, we'll have to... I, I think his book's going to resonate with a lot of people. Oh, yeah. I, I figure it's got bestseller written all over it. I was talking to some people at a dinner last night about it and they're just they're just staring at me like, Holy fuck, really? Like nobody nobody's really heard that that part of it. No, it's uh it's definitely opened even my eyes and you know, like we're kinda got our ear to the ground and I'd never really heard any of these connections brought together before. Yeah. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Who are we gonna have? I think uh, the next one in our little f- Fucking flurry of episodes here is going to be Patty Conklin, right? Yeah, <clears throat> another fascinating one. A lot of people in the chat room like the like that episode too. So that episode will be coming out, and uh, you'll be getting this episode probably after we chat with a couple other people, right? The uh, Bigfoot guys, possibly, and Oscar uh, Miro Casada, a Peruvian shaman. Yeah, we've officially booked. Uh... Randall Carlson as well for I think we're gonna have that in the backstage on a Saturday Saturday the twenty sixth I think at four p.m. Eastern. See, I think that's another blow your mind too, right? Like, uh, it's not really fringe as far as like four uh, T N or paranormal. It's just blow your mind as in like <laughs> all kinds of elements of. What they're, where the mainstream's missing the ball, right? With history and climate and... Yeah, that one could easily go a, a couple hours or more. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and then uh, hopefully we'll be able to reel in Duncan Trussell here soon, too. We've been kind of back and forth with him for a while now, so hopefully we can seal that up. We'll let you guys know, of course. Get Trans- to do the drunken tussle. Drinking water with his headset on. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> and... You can- You can take care of that in post, right? Nope. (laughs) Anyways, spam gram. I want you to. I want to hear Darren say it. It's working. Spam gram. Don't spam. spam Don't spam Darren. You don't spam Darren. You just spam gram. (laughs) I take the PayPal. Yeah, you take the PayPal. Yeah, and you spend the PayPal. So. uh, That's G R A H A M at Gramerica dot com. Thanks for the subscriptions. Uh, thanks for the emails. Thanks for the feedback. Review us on iTunes if you can, or in any other podcast format, or make some comments on the website. It always helps. Yeah, reviews are the reviews are huge. So uh, if you can take five minutes and pop over and give us a review, we'd greatly appreciate it. Uh, I think we can throw. We'll probably throw the link actually in the show notes this week, just to make it a little easier. Right now, just click on show notes, review, done deal. All right. Thanks again, buddy. All right, guys. Enjoy the uh, outro music, and we will see you probably in less than a week.